Thank you. I, Could you stay who you are? Oh, thanks. I'm Leanne Chikoski at the Salk Institute. I appreciated the, the good medicine and the problems with the interpretation, thinking maybe you've been a bad Christian Jew, whatever. But the last part, I have a bit of an issue with. And I think that if we are capable of registering brain states in various states of religious conversation with something that we know, much like Patricia Churchland put forth with the prairie voles, if we, can, if we can register that with something that's known, our job as scientists, I believe, is to offer that up. And if, it, if that says that it challenges people of faith, you know, that, that's our job. <laughs> I, I, so, so I was agreeing with you and, and, and up until the last bit, I'm like, yes, I think that it is, it is something we should say. And I agree. I, I, I think it is our job. The question is, are, are religious people going to experience that as a satisfying account of their religious experience? Or is it going to be seen? There was a paper published in, one of the, in an oncology journal about six or eight years ago called, Can You Measure a Sunbeam with a Ruler? And among the points that the, the paper made was that by using the methods of science to quantify this experience, you obliterate the experience. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to suggest that by understanding that dysregulating the serotonin system leads to a sense of transcendence, obliterates for the, for the devout that experience. And it, all, I'm, all I'm suggesting is that it calls into question attempts to validate religious experience by, un, by understanding it through scientific means. So I agree that that's what scientists should do. The question is whether people who are religiously devout should want that to be done. It's a different question. Neil Tyson. <laughs> Reverend Tyson. <laughs> um, <coughs> I was, <coughs> excuse me. I was, I was concerned, dare I say disturbed, about something you said quite casually. Um, you got your compilation of articles, of, of, of papers, from this secondary source, and then you did the right thing. You went to all of them to see what justification they served, and you removed 80% of them for just being about religion but not about the effects of religion on your health. Fine. And then the rest, you cavalierly said, well, you know, 80 papers were just flawed methodology. Well, if they were all in published journals, why are they in published journals? If, the, if you can sit there and say it's flawed methodology, what, is, what are these fields where you can look at a refereed paper and say 80 papers are flawed methodology? <laughs> and I'll actually give an example of one of the most inf Medicine. That is the field where 80% of the papers or 80 out of 84 will be flawed. I'll give you one example of one of the more influential papers on religion and medicine, and this was published in the Southern Medical Journal. This actually was a randomized trial of intercessory prayer to the Judeo-Christian God to patients in a critical care unit for, uh, actually a cardiac critical care unit. And what they found in the paper was that when both patients and physicians were blinded to whether they were being prayed for, the patients who were prayed for had better outcomes. I looked carefully at the paper and I noticed several things. One, a number of outcomes were evaluated, and we've already heard allusion to the issue of multiple outcomes, and they didn't necessarily clearly state that they listed all the outcomes they looked at. Two, what were the outcomes that achieved benefit? Was there benefit to total mortality? Why no. Was there benefit to number of days in the critical care unit? Why no. There was benefit to need for diuretics, implying, in my opinion, that the Judeo-Christian God is the God of urine, and that if we repeated the study to say a Muslim God or a Buddhist God or some other God, we could come up with the pantheon of deities to pray for for different conditions. In one study, surely you would find benefit to um, cardiac outcomes, in fact, and possibly even total mortality. In another study, you might find benefit to need for blood pressure lowering medications. This passed full peer review. This is a higher quality than many of the papers that are published in medicine. Um, and this is one of, one of the highest quality of the papers that's been published in this field. Having said that, there are also things that, are, that merit saying here, which are that religi religion often provides both social and practical support 
which are things of particular importance to the elderly. When I was a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar at the RAND UCLA, UCLA program, the head of the health program at RAND once made the comment that the biggest health problem in the elderly is loneliness. And he based this on data showing that social support is incredibly important to health. And those data are a lot less weak than the data on religion. And religion, frankly, provides one of the relatively few um, reliable arenas that people are motivated to reproducibly go to when they're elderly. And thinking from somebody that I'm close to who suffered the loss of a spouse and who happens to be very religious, the women from the church came over for a month providing practical support in the form of meals, et cetera, during the time of grief. Thinking of someone here at UC San Diego in the National Academy of Sciences who was an atheist, in his last years he married a Catholic woman, began going to church, and found that he continued to go even when she was out of town because although he remained an atheist, which the priest himself said at the time of the uh, eulogy, he felt profound benefit from the social support he achieved in the church environment. So I think to discount the possibility of benefit from purely practical reasons as part of sort of throwing out the evidence of a benefit from religion to, uh, from the direct religious elements of religion to health is probably premature. And I'll just add the final comment in the, in the case of meditation, that there's no reason to think that meditation has anything to do with religion in terms of health benefits. Deep breathing, in fact, anything that improves tissue oxygenation lowers blood pressure. So I actually think it's likely a priori that meditation, if it involves deep breathing, will have benefits to blood pressure. I agree. So let me just make a couple of comments. I have to play them back on slow motion when they replay the tape, so that we can, <laughs> so we can, we can hear that at normal I'm, speed. I'm very impressed. You actually talk faster than I did. Uh, uh, I'm sure that in astrophysics, the situation is the same as in medicine. There are good journals and bad journals. A great deal of the papers that are uh, supportive of uh, religious, the health benefits of religious practices in medicine are published in the International Journal of Psychiatry and Medicine. Now, that's the 71st, according to the Institute for Scientific Information, the 71st most important psychiatry journal. I didn't even know there were that many psychiatry journals. I'm in the Department of Psychiatry. That there, there are 70 others that are better. So that's one thing. The, the, other, paper, the other element of the Bird paper, that, which you just described, the intercessory prayer paper, it's the only paper I have ever seen in which God is identified as a, acknowledged as a contributor. <laughs> Take a look at the acknowledgment section. No, he didn't. No, he, uh, you know, he may sue for being co a co-author, uh, uh, but he is identified as a contributor. Nowadays, nowadays, people who are acknowledged in medical journals have to sign the release. Yes. Did that take place? No, this was an older paper. It was 1988, so it was before that requirement. So, and I don't think that there, and no one has tried to get a retroactive release that I know of. So, and there was something else I wanted to say, but I don't remember what it is. So. Any other questions? Uh, okay. There you are. Oh, my name, my name is Eugene. Um, I have a question about, uh, about the religious experience you're talking about and knowledge of what goes on and how it affects it. Many drug users probably know exactly what they're getting into and what it's doing to them, yet the experience, they seek it. How does that... You know, how does that work? Uh, Just with ask Hunter Thompson. Uh, sure, uh, I'm, I'm not, but, sure, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Yes, uh, that's why we have a drug addiction problem. They, uh, I'm not sure what that has to do with, uh, with religious experience. You said it ruins the experience. No, no, I didn't say it ruins the experience. Far from it. I mean, it, it provokes the experience for a lot of people. The question, I, my concern is that people who are devoutly religious ought to, I think, object to the identification of their experience of the transcendent with neurochemistry. Th that it can be reduced to mere neuro neurochemistry seems to me to be, ob to be objectionable to, to at least some people. Actually, if you think back, I mean, we're actually going back to Aldous Huxley here because he, that was the first use of neurotheology. Uh, in some of those early books. I actually happen to have the doors of perception here, and just on Eugene's point, 
There is a paragraph here which uh, he says that humanity, that humanity at large will ever be able to dispense with artificial paradises seems very unlikely. Most men and women lead, lead lives at the worst so painful and at the best so monotonous, poor and limited that the urge to escape, the longing to transcend themselves if only for a few moments is and always has been one of the principal appetites of the soul. Art and religion, carnivals and saturnalia, dancing and listening to oratory, all these have served in H.G. Wells's phrase as doors in the wall, which is where the doors of perception and from, from Blake as well. So the comments we had earlier uh, yesterday from John Smith is about some of the, the, the neurotransmitters, neuromodulators, and those effects I think so, uh, are relevant and, and do have bearing on what you've been, what yes. you've been saying. Um, I, I really got to go. You, you have to leave. Yeah. <laughs> um, let, thank you, Richard Sloan. And since we touched on God in the brain, um, that seems to be a natural cue to invoke V.S. Ramachandran.